Hello, everyone. My name is Julia Chen. I am the Activities Director at the Yale Club. And thank you all so much for joining us today for our virtual lecture series, uh, where we're bringing in live speakers for a lecture and a Q&A that you can participate in from your homes. Today, we are excited to welcome Libby Copeland, who is an award-winning journalist who has written for The Washington Post, New York Magazine, New York Times, The Atlantic, and many other publications. She specializes in the intersection of science and culture. Ms. Copeland was a reporter and editor for The Post for 11 years, has been a media fellow and guest lecturer, and has made numerous appearances on television and radio. This evening, we have invited her here to talk about the extraordinary phenomenon of home DNA testing, which is transforming how we think about family and ourselves, and is the focus of her new book, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. So Libby, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book? Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you for having me. This is really a thrill. Um, so as you said, I, you know, I write about the intersection of science and culture. Um, and about three years ago, I wrote a story for the Washington Post uh, about a really interesting um, uh, case of a woman who did DNA testing at the dawn of um, the consumer genomics era, which was not that long ago. It was just eight years ago um, when this type of DNA testing was really getting started. But that was actually a very, very long time in terms of this technology. So she spit into a vial eight years ago and um, her results weren't what she expected. And she embarked on a really complex and surprising genetic detective um, mystery tale, basically. Um, and her story's um, sort of uh, evolution and the explanation for her surprise that she discovered, none of it was very expected. It was all um, very surprising. And um, when that piece came out, I started getting um, emails from people who had read the piece in the Washington Post. And they were, um, they were telling me stories about what had happened to them through DNA testing, you know, stories of um, journeys that they had taken, journeys of identity, journeys of family, um, reunions, um, riffs, stories that were heartbreaking, heartwarming. They ran the whole gamut and um, some of them made me cry. Um, they were so moving. And as I read uh, the hundreds of emails that I got, I thought, man, this is, um, this is a book because this is really about technology intersecting with um, with human nature and with the most intimate parts of our lives. So um, that that became The Lost Family. That's very cool. Um, so having read your book, I know that you talk about the story of Alice Colin Plebuk um, mm -hmm. to frame your book. Um, without spoiling too much about that, can you talk a little bit about why you chose to focus on her and how her quest shows so much about DNA testing? Yeah, so um, Alice was um, an early adopter. She's the person I wrote about in the Washington Post. And then I went back and tell, I tell her story more fully um, in the book. And I'm able to, um, for the book, I was able to go back a 100 years to the beginnings of her genetic mystery um, and do a lot of historical research and also um, climb inside her amazing brain. Um, she's just an incredible person. Um, so she tested in 2012. Um, she tested through a company called Ancestry, which has a, the largest database. Most people have heard of it, even if they haven't tested there, they've heard of them or they've heard of 23andMe. Um, and she was expecting to find that she was almost entirely Irish. Irish and then a little British and Scottish, that was what she expected based on everything she knew and all the genealogy she knew. Um, in fact, what she discovered that was that she was half Ashkenazi Jewish. And, um, you know, there's a very, uh, you know, different people have different sort of genetic signatures. There's a very unique genetic signature if you're Ashkenazi Jewish. And so um, her DNA was very clear that she was half basically Irish and half Ashkenazi Jewish. And she thought, well, wh like, what could be the explanation for this? Um, now, there are a number of explanations, and there are some that are really, really common, and we can talk about those. Um, and a lot of people get a lot of people get um, surprises of certain types when they do DNA testing. Um, um, the vast majority of people don't get a surprise, but when you do get a surprise, it usually falls into several categories. Um, but um, Alice's um, story was was not an expected explanation. It took a lot of twists and turns. Um, but what compelled me about it was that to figure out her mystery, she had to do a lot of um, what's called genetic genealogy, and she also needed to um, entertain a number of theories and then dismiss them. And so um, the great thing about the way that the book is structured is it allows me to sort of take you along on her mystery, um, which I think is pretty propulsive. And 
along the way as she um, goes through theory after theory and sort of says, oh, I, maybe this is the explanation. No, wait, that's not, that's not it. Um, it allows me to show you what that looks like when that is the explanation. Um, and so for the book, I talk, her, her story is sort of the main story. And then I talk with many other people who've done DNA testing um, and, you know, have found that it's changed their lives in one way or another. And it's so interesting how you say that it's changed so many lives, and yet it's something that people can often buy just for fun or give as a present. Right. Can you talk a little about how it can be both of those things? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, home DNA tests, there's four major companies. There's Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree DNA. And the test for the kind of DNA that we're talking about, people are generally testing to find out more about their genetic ancestry. So where their people came from in the world between 500 and 1,000 years ago, approximately. And also to see lists of their genetic relatives. Um, oh, my first cousin's in the database. Oh, my mom's in the database. Look, I can see, you know, I can see that we're related. Um, so basically these tests cost maybe 99 bucks, but sometimes there's a sale. They might even be costing 50 bucks sometimes. Um, and so they're very um, fairly inexpensive and kind of um, low investment way to get into a hobby or to um, continue your hobby, particularly for family historians. Um, this has been an incredible boon. And also the ads are marketed at people who sometimes might not have that much interest in family history, but they're kind of curious. And, you know, they promise to give you a pie chart. The pie chart's going to tell you, oh, how much, how much Swedish do I have? And oh, was my grandfather really Italian? Now I'm going to find out for sure. And so um, they kind of promise to make the past accessible in a way that's really, that's really um, quite um, amazing. Um, there's also these warnings that you get when you test. And the warning will say, um, you may learn something unexpected about your family history, and um, we just want to let you know that. Or you may learn something about your immediate family member and relatives, um, and we want to make sure you're prepared. Um, because it has happened so much that um, at this point, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a sizable minority of the people who've tested who, um, who test and they find out um, that either the circumstances of their coming into the world wasn't what they thought, that one of their parents isn't what they thought, that their nuclear family isn't what they assumed, that their um, ethnic story isn't what they understood. Um, and so there's all these sort of ways that the past can kind of zoom forward to the present and you can suddenly be confronted with something. Um, and for some people, um, they go in with an idea that that there might be, um, there might be, uh, they have a question mark and they're looking to get answers, but a lot of people don't. And um, Finding out in this way, you know, paying 89 bucks and spitting into a tube and four weeks later you get back something on your screen and it says something completely like shocking to you and you're, you know, maybe um, in your midlife or, or even later, it, it can be a really um, profound emotional process to go through. Wow. So um, in your book, you write about NPEs or non-paternity events or not parent expected. Um, which are really fascinating. Can you explain a little bit about those and how common they are? Yeah, so um, the four major databases um, contain about 35 million people at this point. The vast majority of them are Americans. Um, and um, of the kind of surprises that you can get, um, one, of the, the, one of the most common, if not the most common, is this discovery of an NPE or non-paternity event sometimes translated also as um, not parent expected, which means one or both your parents isn't who you thought. Um, typically, this is a father. Um, it can also be an instance where perhaps you weren't told you were adopted. And so you're discovering in one fell swoop that neither of your parents is genetically related to you. Um, so um, that is about between one and 2% of the population, according to population geneticists, um, you know, have, were, you know, conceived through an NPE. So their, their, their father isn't who they thought. Um, and the other fairly common scenario, um, which is sort of akin to it, um, and can kind of sometimes come hand in hand with an NPE, is discovering that you have um, a half sibling you didn't know about, or a sibling you didn't know about, or um, that somebody you thought of as a full genetic sibling is a half genetic sibling. Um, so if you put those two things together, um, discovering either one of those things or the other or both at the same time, um, it's probably um, at least a million Americans 
who've discovered um, one of those two scenarios. Uh, and then if you look at um, all the other kinds of surprises that you can get and the ways that a single secret can refract across a family, um, it's many millions of people who are affected by, um, by these revelations that come out um, as a result of testing. And how have you found that people respond to these, like both the person that did the test and the right. people who did never wanted the secret to come out? Yeah, I mean, um, it's really interesting. It's a huge emotional process. I started interviewing people in 2017 and I would talk to them through 2018 and 2019 and I'm still in touch with them now. And what I'm finding is that it, it is a lifelong journey for them to um, kind of process this news because you know you have a narrative of who you are. You have um, a beginning and a middle. And when your story of your origins changes, um, it really changes everything. It, it changes um, it changes the past. It also changes the present. It can change your sense of the future. Um, it can be um, something that, you know, oftentimes people respond at first with shock. There's denial. Um, they may not believe the results. They often call the companies and the customer service agents at companies like Ancestry have now specialized um, teams that deal with people who call up to say, uh, you know, I don't believe the results, or how can this be? As they have like sort of sensitive inquiry um, teams that you know that that um, that help out for those cases, um, and those people, um, when the people are discovering something about themselves, and when they've sort of been the agents in their own discovery, um, they can be shocked. They can they can experience some trauma. They can experience um, anxiety, sadness, grief. Um, uh, and I've talked to psychologists about sort of the processes, and um, uh, there's starting to be psychologists specializing in this. Um, but what's interesting to me is that when you discover something germane about the truth about your own identity or your genetic identity, um, even when that truth is painful, um, the vast majority of people will say ultimately that they're glad to know. Um, even, even when it's hard to process, they just put such a high value on the truth. That's not necessarily true for the people on the other side. So um, I've definitely um, heard of and reported in my book cases where, for instance, a man who maybe didn't know that he had helped conceive a child or maybe did know, um, you know, he, he says he doesn't know, um, you know, for instance, deleted his kit, didn't want any further communication with his genetic daughter. Um, and there are, there are many instances of that. Um, I write about another story of um, a woman who discovered she was adopted by doing DNA testing at the age of 51, which was Quite a traumatic experience and um, you know ultimately her genetic father through his lawyer sent her a cease and desist letter to say I don't want to have any more contact with you and her um, her genetic mother was no longer alive but um, her genetic mother's children who are her sisters um, wanted nothing to do with her so um, you know it, it puts people in a really difficult position because they've been sort of um, they've been denied the truth of their own identities and then they kind of um go knocking on someone else's door saying hey like it turns out i'm your half sister can we have a relationship and it's very painful for the people on the other side so there's a lot of um tension and friction in the way sometimes sometimes that this can play out wow so i can definitely see how that affects like the individuals um how did this change how we should think about family or like is a nuclear family expanding now that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I've almost wondered sometimes if there needs to be like additional language for the way that we describe relationships, because I think, um, you know, many of us already know that, um, you know, that, 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 that family is not just biology and family is not um, just not biology, right? It's not, we don't define family only by the people we're related to because you also genetically related to because obviously we have um, marriage and we have adoptive parenting and foster parenting we have donor conception we have all these other ways of defining family um, and i think that this um brings that home even more right that 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 um that if you um if you are in your 60s and you suddenly discover that you're donor conceived um, and that the man who, you ra who raised you, who you adore and is no longer alive, uh, is not genetically related to you. Um, it's not as if you all of a sudden say, well, that man's not my father. Of course he's your father. 
But it's also, um, depending on your circumstances, it may be the case that you also want to know the man who contributed half of your genetics, right? Um, and that he is also something to you if, you if he's still alive and you can get to know him. And he's, he's, he's another uh, relationship. Maybe he's also a father. Maybe he's not a father. Maybe you have to come up with another word. This is why I think we need words. And people do are coming up with their own language um, for this. I, uh, there's a woman I interviewed who was um, donor conceived and she um, has 23 siblings, I think. Um, and you know, has had to figure out relationships with all her half siblings through this donor father. But she eventually arrived at the term pops for her genetic father, the man who donated half her material, who she didn't know until she was an adult. You know, it wasn't dad, it wasn't father. She already had a, a person who raised her and was her, was her dad. Um, but Pops kind of, she liked that, you know, it suggested some affection and some relationship. Um, and it reflected her, her, how much she liked him and her appreciation for him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really complex territory that we've entered into, that's for sure. Yeah, well, that one at least has a nice and happy ending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, mix. So I believe that this year marks the 20th anniversary of home DNA testing for ancestral purposes. That's a huge milestone. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how the industry started? Yeah, so it started, it was actually founded um, in, in April of 2000, which is exactly 20 years ago. The wow. um, first company that was doing DNA testing for Ancestry sent out its first kits in April of 2000. Um, and uh, for the book, I went down to Houston um, and I interviewed the founder of that company. The company is called Family Tree DNA, and it was founded by a man named Bennett Greenspan, who is a... A uh, fascinating genealogist. He's been a genealogist since he was 12. He's completely devoted to the study of family history. And he founded this company thinking that it would never be more than a, than a niche product. And he told me, um, we sat in his office and he told me, you know, how he came to found it. He was, he founded it basically to solve a mystery in his own family. He was trying to figure out. Uh, and he, like in the beginning would go to these conferences, these like genealogy conferences. And he would say, hey, I've got this product. It's really going to help you with your family history research. Don't you want to buy it? And people would be like, what? No. <laughs> and he said he had to kind of basically like talk them back to his booth and try to like drag them toward like his displays. So it, it's astonishing to me to see that we have come from that to this. And the first 10 years were really slow progress. And then in the last 10, um, from 2010 to 2020, you know, we went from, um, you know, Ancestry and 23andMe, I think both sold a million kits, I want to say in wow. uh, 2015. And now um, Ancestry has 16 million, 23andMe has 10 million. Um, and altogether, there's between 30 and 35 million between the four companies. So it's, it's just been like an incredible growth. That is an amazing number of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with that much, I think you've written that this is the tipping point. Um, what do you mean right. by that? So what it means is that um, the, a, the vast majority of people, um, particularly people of European descent who live in the United States, are now um, findable. Um, they're not, you know, it's not that your DNA is in the database of ancestry if you never tested, but you, you know, your, um, your sibling tested or your, your aunt tested or your niece tested or your child tested. And there's enough information in there, um, relating to you because of the way that, you know, um, genetics, is, you know, genetic material is shared that, um, if there's, um, some sort of say genetic family secret in your in your family um your choose your choice to opt out kind of doesn't matter um in, in other words we're all kind of implicated by the technology so for instance if your um if your brother uh unbeknownst to him conceived a child 40 years ago um and he says well i'm i'm you know i i don't want to go down that road so i'm not going to test if you test, uh, that child can find him through you. So it, it means that none of us really get to opt out anymore. And it means that we all kind of have to go a kind of, a kind of reckoning with, you know, uh, 
with the truth that can be discovered this way. Wow. That yeah. is, that's pretty terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I was fascinated by in your book, because you talked about how we've seen some implications for solving cold case murders. Um, I'd never even considered that. Can you talk more about how that's happening and the implications of that? Yeah, sure. So a lot of people have probably heard of the Golden State Killer case. This happened in the spring of 2018, so just two years ago. Um, and what it, what it was was an incredible breakthrough um, because what the investigators did was they took um, the DNA that had been left behind by a serial rapist and murderer, and they put it into a kind of quasi-public open access database of DNA of, of genetic information. Um, it's called GEDmatch, and people um, tr traditionally, genealogists, hobbyists, family historians have used it. They would take their DNA out of, um, say, 23andMe. They would download the information. They would upload it to GEDmatch so that they could compare across different databases. Because if you test in 23andMe, you can't compare with someone who's in the Ancestry database. So this allowed them to kind of look at each other's and also use some tools that were helpful there. Um, so that that database at the time had about a million people, which is far, far fewer than what's in, say, 23andMe or Ancestry right now. Um, but the key difference was that it was accessible to law enforcement because it was quasi-public. Mm -hmm. And so law enforcement went in there, they put in the DNA of this, uh, of this um, murderer and, and rapist, um, and they were able to you know, even though he had never undergone DNA testing, and again, this is the way we're all sort of, you know, wrapped into this, um, they were able to figure out his identity based on um, cousins, distant, you know, semi-distant, not, not even necessarily like a first cousin, a third or fourth cousin can be enough to figure this out. And they could figure out his identity by basically triangulating the information and building family trees up and then building family trees down to present day people and narrowing it down to a suspect who they arrested. And since that time, this has become a new field. So now um, the field is called investigative genetic genealogy or forensic genetic genealogy. And there are people who specialize in this. There are companies that are starting to devote to this. And um, they, they can't at this point access the large commercial databases, um, but they can access uh, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, which is the oldest company that I was talking about. They've also um, made their information accessible because they want to work with law enforcement on this as well. Um, and the last time I checked, I think there were over 90 cold cases that had been solved this way. It's probably higher now. But these are cases going back, in some cases, I think to the 50s. And they're, you know, cases in some, in some instances, really, really brutal murders um, that, that they couldn't, they simply could not solve any other way and have been sitting dormant for decades. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely not what they originally developed the technology for. Right. Um, and while, of course, it's a positive to catch uh, these horrendous murderers, I mean, what are the implications of that? I mean, this was not yeah. what people submitted their tests for either. Right, right. And it's, it's an interesting thing because you see this huge debate and, you know, explore this in the book because it all happened as I was writing the book and I was like, whoa, okay. Um, and I started talking to privacy experts and, um, you know, legal experts about, you know, like, is this is this um, is this lawful? Uh, is this appropriate? What are the implications for privacy for civil liberties? And you know you get you get a wide range. I mean, thus far, um, it, it's it, it you know no one has challenged it really in a court, so it hasn't um, it hasn't had to go all the way up to to the Supreme Court or really be tested. Um, but, uh, you know, there are objections to it being used this way. There are um, people feeling like, you know, in some ways, everyone gets implicated in a, in a sort of a, a chain in a family, a genetic family by this. And therefore, um, it's inappropriate or it's inappropriate because the, the DNA was not taken, the DNA was not taken for the purposes of being used this way. Mm -hmm. um, but from the data I've seen from polling of Americans, most Americans seem to feel that this is a good use of their genetic information. And the main concern seems to be like a slippery slope. Like what is the, like what are the parameters of how you use this? Like, okay, serial killer from the 1970s, that sounds good, but what about, you know, other uses that are like not, maybe not violent crimes? Like what, 
who's, who's sort of put the guardrails on this and who's making sure that it's just using being used in a way that's consistent with you know the worst kinds of crimes yeah so it's all a matter of we can do this now should we and how far does it right. go which is always the debate right like <laughs> that's always the debate yeah um, so going back to a little bit about the different communities um in your research can you speak more about how this has affected some communities for example adoptees or the donor conceived or even like the african-american community given the history of yeah. slavery in america yeah sure um yeah, so, you know, obviously um, adoptees are a huge category community of people who have used DNA testing. They've been using this for years. Um, when the Golden State Killer case happened, a lot of genetic genealogists were like, well, you may be surprised, but we've been using this tech these techniques to help adoptees find their birth parents for, you know, eight years now. Um, so that's pretty interesting, you know, that, that those methods were never new to genetic genealogy, you know, in the last 10 years, but, but most of us hadn't, hadn't heard of them. So um, in a lot of states, you know, uh, adoptees can't access their original birth certificates. And so they don't have access to understanding who their uh, genetic parents were. And so this um, DNA testing has been used for a long time with them. There's a lot of um, search angels who will help them. Um, and the, as far as the donor conceived community goes, um, a lot of donor conceived people have also been using um, DNA testing for this purpose. There's a lot of interest in finding out who your donor father is to understand your, your, maybe your genetic ancestry background, maybe to understand medical issues, and also just to know because people are yeah, anyway, so I, I, don't, I don't know where it cut out, but what I was saying was that um, that there are instances where people have found that they have um, as many as between 100 and 200 half siblings through the same donor father. And um, that then prompts all these questions about how do you form relationships with these people? You know, how well do you want to get to know them? Um, there's these sort of sprawling families of half, half siblings, half donors, you know, donor conceived half siblings all across the country. So that's really fascinating. Um, and I talk about those, both those things in the book, the importance of DNA testing to the adoptee community, to the donor conceived. And I also talk about it um, in, with regard to people whose um, genetic ancestry was, um, you know, was, was hidden from them for whatever reason, um, or perhaps sort of hidden by history. Um, and I talk about a man named Rosario, who um, it turns out is of significant, um, African ancestry, but his mother um, basically told him that he was Sicilian to protect him from the discrimination that she had faced. And that's not such a rare story. I, I, I interviewed a number of people who experienced something like that, where they were told that they were, you know, Italian or Native American. In fact, they were African, but, but for historical reasons, their families had passed, um, you know, because they were trying to escape discrimination um, or they passed and then perhaps it was forgotten. Um, because it went really far back. So, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of reckoning with history that's, that's happening too through this, where, um, you know, Rosario was saying he was looking at the history of America with new eyes because it was, um, he was starting to understand, you know, what his people along that branch and his mother's line had been through and um, the links she had gone to to basically protect him from the truth because she thought that the truth would hurt him. Um, and those stories are just incredibly moving in what they tell about the history of America, really. Wow. So you've done so much research um, and into all of the DNA testing. Have you taken one? And did you find anything interesting in your results? Yeah, yeah, I've tested at three different companies, actually. Oh. Um, and, you know, I had like the more common experience, which is like the majority of people have an experience where they find something um, that's interesting, that's illuminating, but um, ne not necessarily like totally jarring. Um, we were able to find um, close cousins, second cousins that we would never have been able to find without DNA testing. One um, is in Sweden, and we would not have known that they, that these cousins existed um, because, uh, because basically there's an NPE in the line, right? So the, the paper trail would not have told us that they were there. 
Um, and we actually went to Sweden and met these cousins, which was completely remarkable. This was my dad's second cousin. So um, his ancestor, his grandmother had come over in the 1890s, I think. And, um, and you know, it, that's just not so long ago. It, you're, it's amazing how not long ago that is. And um, then through my mom's side, um, on my mother's side, we are Ashkenazi Jewish. And we discovered that she had a second cousin from Ukraine and that that branch of the family, which had been left behind by my mother's ancestor, her grandfather never talked about it. He was just, I'm out of the old country and I'm in the new country and I'm not talking about the past. But um, it turns out he left a lot of siblings behind and at mm. least one of those branches survived survived pogroms, survived World War II, you know, the Holocaust and, um, and the USSR. And that second cousin is now living in New York. And again, never would have known, you know, so DNA testing is incredible. It can be, you know, so illuminating, such a gift. Um, and also, you know, um, really change people's sense of themselves and their place in the world. And it's, it's like, it's everything, like a lot of technologies. It, it's, it plays out really differently in different people's lives. That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose one question a little bit more on my side, because in my in my communities, when we talked about it, we always say we don't really do, don't do the test. It pretty much tells us I'm Chinese, 100%. It's not a very right. interesting result versus for the European population who you get to see more interesting information because they have that backlog. Have you seen that this is spreading to and having more information about different types of communities? Yeah, so you would like really like more granular information rather than just like, Yes, you would like more like specific region, not just like Chinese. Yeah. I don't know a ton about how it is um, for, uh, for Ch the, you know, people of Chinese descent. Um, I've definitely heard complaints that it's not great for, from people of Asian descent in general. Um, the, uh, the sort of genetic databases are historically European and white, and then the companies themselves you know, the people who are clamoring to buy these tests are, are of European white descent. So, you know, they're catering perhaps to that population. There's historical reasons why the results are better for them. 23andMe has been trying to make the, their, um, a number of populations more robust so that they get better results so that it's not just like, you're from West Africa. Um, and so they've been trying to do that, particularly with people of Latin American and African American descent, and I think some other populations as well. Um, and to do that, basically, they have to recruit people who have like four, uh, you know, four grandparents with deep roots in that particular place. And they have to um, develop these, they have these sort of big, but also growing um, population reference sets where like those people, they actually look at those people and they, they study their DNA and they look for patterns and then they compare it to yours. And that's how they make that prediction. So they're always actively trying to in, you know, make those groups bigger, but you'll definitely see like, you know, British, the British population reference set will be like really, really big. And then like another <laughs> population that, you know, I don't know, Indonesia maybe will be very, very small. Um, and you just say, well, that, you know, 50 people can't stand in for an entire nation. Um, but there's all sorts of complications as well with these um, ethnicity estimates, you know, that have to do with um, history and war and migration and porous borders and definitional questions. So it, the whole question of the ethnicity estimate you get is, um, is a really interesting one. It's really interesting how they develop it. And it's also something to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt, because while they're fairly good, they're not, um, they're not as good as like the relative predictions that you get where, you know, if it says you're, you know, closely related to someone, you're closely related to someone. You know, there sometimes can be a little bit of um, uh, stuff where they tell you you're a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and then they update their results. And that that little bit of Swedish or that little bit of Korean or that little bit of, um, you know, Nigerian disappears. Mm. Got it. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about your predictions for where these companies are going to go? So there's been um, kind of a slowdown in sales in the last few months, maybe six months to a year. Um, and I think that, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they've, pro experts think that it's probably because they've basically vacuumed up other people who are interested in doing this for ancestry purposes, right? If you're a family historian, you've probably tested, you might've tested at three or four places. Um, and so what they're doing now is they're unveiling these more tests for health-related results. 
So um, Ancestry has recently started offering, um, you know, testing for treats and for, you know, diseases. And MyHeritage, which is another large company, has also started that. And 23andMe always did. So there's thinking that there's going to be more of a turn towards that, more of a perhaps a kind of convergence between the private testing companies and the medical establishment, because you see them working with um, physicians networks um, and doctors um, and maybe genetic counselors, depending on the company. Um, but I think that it's clear that the databases are going to continue to grow um, because they're going to figure out how to appeal to people. And, um, you know, I think that that basically means that we all have to figure out what it means to live in a world where there are no genetic secrets. And um, that may mean understanding more about your medical history and the question of whether you want to know whether you're at risk of early onset Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, you know, I mean, um, as more and more people get tested, that becomes more of a growing question. Um, and it also means um, grappling with a world in which, you know, if, um, if a child was conceived even 67 years ago and did not know the identity of his father, he may be able to discover it now. And he may be reaching out to another family and saying, hey, I'm your long lost cousin slash sibling slash, you know, uncle, what have you. Um, and that means we all need to be having kind of conversations about, about living in this era of a genetic reckoning. Wow. Um, so the last question before we move to some Q&A from the audience, um, what advice do you have for people who are thinking of taking a home DNA test? So that's a good question. So I used to say, um, I used to say, like, think carefully because, you know, you should know that, um, that, you know, the companies give these warnings, but most people assume that the warnings don't apply to them because they assume they already know everything there is to know about their family. So they gloss over that and they check the box and they spit into the tube and then they may find something that's um, maybe they're ultimately glad to know, but it's a lot to handle in the moment, or maybe they're not glad to know and um, you just make sure you're ready. So I used to give that spiel, but I don't give that spiel anymore because I just think at this point, um, it cuts the cats out of the bag box. The cats like run away. <laughs> <laughs> um, by which I mean like, you know, there's enough people. There's like that tipping point that I was talking about, right? 30 to 35 million people, almost the vast majority of the Americans already in the databases. So if there is something that's going to come out, like it's going to come out if it hasn't already. It's not a question of if it's a question of when, it might be 10 years down the line. Um, and so the advice I give is actually not about the question of whether to take the test. It's my audience is the people who might be in possession of genetic secret that they maybe need to think about talking to someone and telling them that it, this secret concerns them. So for instance, if your child um, was conceived by a sperm donor and you never told them or was adopted and you never told them, this might be a time to think about how you want to figure out how to tell them. And there are people and resources to help you through that process. Um, and that's because from talking to lots and lots of people, um, people are more upset about having not been told the truth than they are about the truth itself. Over and over, people said, you know, I feel like I was lied to. That's the betrayal, the trust in the relationship. Now, Things, decisions that were made 70, 60 years ago about conception under vastly different circumstances, those were not considered lies back then. Obviously, people did the very best they could. And so it's very unfair to judge, you know, decisions made by parents back then by modern day standards. But the reality is we are where we are now. We're living in an era of, you know, transparency and authenticity and speaking your own truth. And people, they want to know. So I think that the advice is to look into um, the wisdom of people who counsel people in this area and consider whether this is something that you maybe need to start disclosing. That's some pretty good advice. <laughs> so while everyone else thinks of if they have any questions, um, I guess I would be interested to hear more about, I studied bioethics, so my, all my big questions are about how does this go forward? And when, especially when you mentioned about how this information is going out, and we have to think about our genetic information being public. First thing that comes to mind is the movie Gattaca and this inevitable future when everyone knows everything about you and how people can make decisions about you based on that then. Right. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, there were, um, there were times when I definitely thought of that movie when I was writing the book. Um, there is, you know, this concern over, um, genetic discrimination 
uh, and this has not actually happened yet to my knowledge, but there are a lot of people who are concerned that if they partake in commercial DNA testing, as well as testing through their doctor's office, that there may come a point when um, they can't get insurance as a result of that. So there's, there's some federal protections. There's a, a law called GINA, and that protects against certain kinds of genetic discrimination, um, health insurance and employment, I believe. But it doesn't protect uh, for, say, long-term care insurance, disability insurance, and there are a number of other loopholes. So the question is, could there be a scenario, there was a, there was a, a, a bioethicist actually who walked me through the scenario. He said, you know, imagine that you decide to buy a particular kind of insurance, um, disability insurance, and you, um, you know, request it, and they ask you, have you ever taken a, a genetic test? Um, he says, if you, if you don't answer, let's say you've, you've tested, let's say you tested at 23andMe for fun, and um, you don't say, well, I don't want to disclose that it actually said that I might have an elevated risk of, you know, Parkinson's. So you say, no, I've never tested. If they were to discover that you had, um, then you're, um, you could have been considered to have committed fraud. And if you say yes, then they may request your, you know, if they say, yes, I did test, then they may say, okay, what did you just find out? Please, you know, let us know. So, um, you know, again, that hasn't happened. But I can't tell you how many people I've talked to. I talk to a lot of people who've done DNA testing and are really into it. And then I talk to a lot of people who haven't and are like, I'll never do that. And it's one of the top reasons that they offer. Um, there's just this kind of con concern that, that there could be some future um, where you know this information could be used against you. And, and part of the issue is we don't know what we don't know, right? We don't know how this information could be used. So um, you know, the, your decision to spit or swab your cheek could potentially have implications for your child and, and that child's child, right? Because you share that genetic information. So, um, you know, not knowing what you don't know makes it a little bit difficult to make a decision. And there's also concerns about, um, you know, security breaches, um, if the information were to come out, if your genetic information is, is stored somewhere and it's, and it's breached. Or um, if I, you know, I spit into a tube at a particular company because I trust their privacy policy and their consent materials, and I think it's all really awesome, but in 20 years, another company buys that company and all their information, and they have a different privacy policy. So, again, you don't know what you don't know. It makes it tricky. Um, so we had a question actually asking about the different companies that you've looked into and, like, which ones you thought were, like, better or more secure or had just more information to provide. Yeah, so um, Ancestry has the largest database. So a lot of, uh, there's 60 million people in the database. So a lot of times if a person is testing because they're looking for a genetic parent or um, a genetic sibling, um, they will test there because they have the highest likelihood of finding something, someone there. Um, it used to be once upon a time that databases were so small that you'd have to, um, fish in all four ponds was how genetic genealogists talk about it. So you'd have to spit in three or four, uh, three or four companies, depending on how many there were at the time, and just scour the results. And if you were lucky, you found a second or a third cousin, second cousin was a home run, a third cousin, maybe you could figure it out based on that. If you had, you know, maybe more than one, um, it, you know, now one database can be enough. 23andMe is also extremely large, 10 million people. Um, and 23andMe um, and, and Ancestry now both offer, um, you know, health-related testing. So those are the kind of big ones if you're looking for, um, uh, you know, large databases. My heritage is uh, pretty big now, too. It's gotten a lot bigger. Um, and um, Family Tree DNA offers um, sort of niche testing if you're a genealogist. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Also, some of them can be better for certain populations, which makes it really tricky to say, well, this one's better than that. But, you know, all, you'll find that some are better at predicting Western Europe and some are better at predicting, you know, I don't know, Eastern Europe. So, it, it, you know, it, it, it sort of depends what you're looking for. Gotcha. So another person is asking if you could share maybe some of the most interesting stories you've gotten through your research and asking people about their yeah. testing. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I mean, uh, one of the most compelling stories I came across was this story of Linda Minton, who was the late discovery adoptee that I mentioned earlier. By the way, a late, a late discovery adoptee is just the term when you discover late that you were adopted, like you discover it, like you weren't told in childhood, you find out much later. And she was the one who was 51 um, when she found out, and she found out by spitting into a tube. Now, the reason she spit into a tube was because she was, she thought she had ovarian cancer. And um, she had all these signs. Um, her doctor was very concerned. She had a number of symptoms. She had a test that she had taken of an elevated tumor biomarker. They, they had a bunch of reasons why they thought that they needed to give her a radical hysterectomy. And the, on top of everything else was that she believed herself to be um, half Ashkenazi Jewish through her mother. So she went to her mom she got her mom's family his health history. She gave it to her doctor, um, yada, yada, yada. And um, she gets the radical hysterectomy. And it is not till shortly after the surgery that she gets back her results from having tested at one of these commercial companies. I think it was Ancestry. And that's the test that reveals that she is not related to her mother. She is not half Ashkenazi Jewish, she is adopted. And her mother didn't tell her, even when she went to her mother and said, I need a family health history. Her mother didn't take the opportunity to say, you're adopted, so you know any implications of genetics as far as family health history go. Like, so Linda is like, she sets out, she's, I mean, she's, you know, she's torn apart, she's upset, she's angry, all this stuff. But she also eventually sets out to find um, her family on both sides. And she encounters rejection at every turn. Um, and, you know, I think part of this has to do with a clash of narratives. You know, if I come to you and I say, hey, I'm your big sister conceived 10 years before. Um, had uh, about 18% African ancestry um, before he, um, you know, his mother had um, concealed the truth from him for, for understandable reasons. Um, and so he was able to connect up with um, his mother's African-American family. And um, one of the things he, he really struggled with was whether he could um, identify as African-American. And he really kind of struggled with um, whether, um, you know, something that a lot of people in the book talk about, you know, is, is your ethnicity and your understanding of the world, is that your experience or is that your genetics? Um, and um, if it was denied to you for a certain reason, can you claim it now? Um, particularly for him, could he claim being black when he did not look black and he did not have the kind of experiences that other black people have had? You know, he, he'd never been um, uh, faced discrimination or had difficulty hailing a cab or um, been followed around in a store. And he almost felt like um, or, or shared in, or shared in the cultural experience of being black, and and you know any of that stuff. So he just was not sure um, if he could even call himself that. And that was a really interesting conversation, series of conversations I had with him, that a number of people in the book explored in different ways. And the protagonist of the book winds up exploring because she discovers that she's you know half ethnically Jewish, which is like you know, what are you when DNA shows you to be something other than you've always believed yourself to be? Um, is it meaningless? And most people will tell you it's not meaningless. Is it everything? It's also probably not everything, right? Because you also have your experience of something else and that's deeply meaningful too. Um, and so that wrestling with um, moving away from kind of binary definitions, binary definitions of family, biology versus, versus intention, binary definitions of, um, ethnic orientation, um, you know, again, genetics versus experience and intention. Um, you know, those things are things I think we always have, we always have thought about. Um, I, you know, I identify with some parts of my family history more than others, um, just because I do. And I think that DNA testing brings those even more to the fore in terms of how we, um, how we struggle with our self-definition, how we um, identify ourselves to the world. Um, and um, you know, I, I hope the book gets that across with with a great deal of nuance. That these are that these are complex conversations about basically what it means to be human that we all struggle with. It's just that the DNA age, I guess, throws them into greater relief.
Awesome. Well, I think that is a great place to end. Uh, thank you so much. I learned so much here and I need to reconsider taking a DNA test. Um, but I think this was just a fascinating lecture. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Thank you everyone for joining us today. If you haven't had the chance, uh, do read Livy's book. It is available for purchase online. I believe there's an ebook version as well. And other than that, we have a full list of events upcoming. So please check out the club's calendar and I hope to see you at one of them soon. Until then, stay home, stay safe and stay connected. We'll see you soon.